Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. We all, no matter how old we are, how young, how rich, how poor, what color, need attention. That is our basic need. Attention is energy. We feel it. And when we feel the attention we're giving, given, we can see attention, we can hear attention. Attention is a dimensional word that we use our whole lives. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. If you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with Sarah McIntyre of Bright Inbound Marketing and with Natasha Vorompiova of Systems Rock, then do check them out after you've listened to today's conversation. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, the delightful Alice Aspen March, the author of The Attention Factor, radio show host of Why Our Attention Matters. Alice has a long and distinguished career as a researcher, a speaker, a coach on all things to do with attention, and her message is really clear. The kind of attention we get and we give to others is vital and impacts our behaviour and our feelings. In our discussion, Alice talked to me about how to give attention to yourself first and know what attention you require. She explained how to give attention to others in a way that's supportive of their needs and why attention in the workplace will increase productivity, morale, engagement and output of your team. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Alice Aspen March. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast today from New York in the USA, Alice Aspen March, who's an inspirational author, a motivational speaker. She discovered the attention factor, and she also hosts the Why Our Attention Matters global radio show. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Alice. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Thank you very much, Jurgen. I'm very happy to be here. Now, Mark Halpert, who was our guest on episode 258 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you, Alice. So big hello to Mark. Now, before we start talking about all things attention factor and why attention matters, give us a bit of a whistle-stop tour of your background and how you got to where you are today, how you discovered the attention factor, because I think there's a lot in that story. Well, thank you, and I agree with you. Uh, I think I'm going to start with uh, my career really started before I was born. <laughs> uh, I'm an only child. I was born to a very prominent ophthalmologist in Detroit, Michigan. That was my father. And my mother was a teacher. She'd gone to college. Um, And she was also a a concert pianist. Mm. They were both born in Ohio, and they moved to Detroit before I was born. Uh, This all makes a difference because being an only child, they wanted a perfect child. 
it would have meant something to them because I think it would have meant that they were really okay. You know, years ago, nobody talked about attention except in a in a very negative way. And it's our primary need. It's been documented and researched. I've researched it till forever. We all, no matter how old we are, how young, how rich, how poor, what color, need attention. That is our basic need. And we grow up not knowing that. At least I did, and I assume that all the people that I've been talking to for 30 years um, went, uh, grew up the same way. But to go back to my background, um, at the time, in about 1977, well, I had three boys, three sons, and some husbands. I didn't know how to choose a husband who really met my needs, but I didn't know I had any. The first time I ever went in to get any help, the man said to me, Alice, what do you need? And I said to him, what do you mean, what do I need? I didn't even understand the question. Mm. Well, it really turned out that I had my mother's needs. That was the bottom line. Um, and the first symptom I really showed of not getting what I needed or getting it badly was I turned out to be a selective mute. I didn't say a word until I was in kindergarten uh, when I was five years old. And I, I wa uh, everybody knew I wasn't talking, I was pointing. My mother said, you got everything you wanted just by pointing. But I did not talk. And my parents realized that the medical profession was talking about their daughter. What's wrong with Dr. Spiro's daughter? And they were quite ashamed of that, of me at that point. I didn't know this. But they took me to a very fine child development center when I was 19 months old. And fortunately, my mother saved a letter from the center. And it was wonderful for me to see because it said, it was fun to test Alice. Uh, she was a very good tester. And uh, she's a delightful person and leave her alone. She'll develop at her mm -hmm. own rate. When she was through, she went over to the corner, put her snowsuit on her galoshes or gloves and left. And I really like that part. So fast forward to kindergarten. They had me go to one speech correction class. And the nice lady gave me a mirror and said, Alice, I want you to put this mirror in front of your face and open your mouth and see if you can find that thing hanging down in your, the back of your throat. And she, then she said, because that's where your words come from. <laughs> and you know what? I haven't stopped talking since. <laughs> but I had to figure out why I was withholding speech. It took me a long time, actually. But it's because I did not like my parents' energies. It was too tough for me. It was like a demand. Mm. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit um, because energy, attention is energy. We feel it. We feel the energy that we are, we feel the attention we're giving, given. We can see attention. We can hear attention. Attention is a dimensional word that we use our whole lives but I don't think anybody else has ever talked about it like I am because I had an epiphany when I was looking for my youngest sons, the reason or what I had done to first create or enable him to be a television addict. And from that he became, he went to using drugs and I was terrified that I could lose him. Living in Los Angeles at that time was awful for young kids. Awful. There was too much drug usage. But I want to go back to, um, I grew up as a, as a really 
energetic, uh, creative uh, leader in my house. But I didn't really realize, I thought I had really nice parents. I felt a lot of that. I don't mean that good parents, and I probably did, but they only did what they knew what to do. Hmm. Which is why I'm telling everybody, stop being angry with your parents now, because they never got the kind of attention they needed either, yeah. nor did their parents. So even today, when I go in and I, I'm a big speaker, and I say, okay, guys, how many of you have got the kind of attention you needed today? They laugh. They just laugh because it's so ridiculous. They know they didn't, and they don't know what to do about it. Mm. So anyway, there was a lot of things that my father, who was the boss in the family, kept me from doing because he didn't think his daughter, well, first of all, he didn't want to have any children because he knew that he didn't know how to be a father. This was in the thirties. Um, but there was a reason for that that I didn't find out for a very long time, and you've asked why, and I'm going to give you as much why I'm so passionate about this, and at the age of 88, I'm still running around delivering my work, and people are saying to me, how come we never heard this before? It doesn't matter where I go, New Zealand, Mexico, I've never been to Australia, but I have been in New Zealand, Belgium, England, Mexico, Canada, they say the same thing to me after I'm through talking. Why haven't we heard this before? Anyway, so I get married uh, at 19, my husband's drafted, and we go to Japan. Now, this is very important because the first thing that Dr. Ka uh, Dr. Takeo Masaki said to me was, Alice, I want you in my house. I know what it is to be a foreigner in a foreign land. I went to Germany to get my degree. That was the first time a man in that position had ever told me that he wants me in his house. Unlike my father, who was afraid. My father was really a lovely, lovely man, but he didn't know what he needed either. He's a fabulous doctor. And I grew up being his daughter. That was my identification. You're Dr. Spiro's daughter? Yes, I am. But along with that came, let's not make our daughter too strong or too much of a leader because she'll leave us and we need her which is not uncommon, I now know. Hmm. I didn't know it at the time, of course. I got no role modeling from my mother at all because my father told my mother that, that uh, you're a doctor's wife now and that's what you're gonna be. You, I want you not to earn any money. I don't want you to work. I don't want you to be a teacher. I, I don't want you to be a president, nothing. And that's what I saw. So I really didn't like my mother very much because I wanted more from her. And I have a tremendous amount of empathy for this lady, my mother. They're both gone now, my folks. Um, and I, I really wish I could talk to them both. Uh, I, I have a lot to say. I, I have a lot to say to them. So let me ask you, let me ask you this. Um, I mean, in the English language, there's this expression we have, pay attention. And it's kind of like a demand for I'm going to say something or I'm going to show you something, so pay attention to what it is that that I have to say. But Absolutely. but we don't have we don't have the attitude that you're talking about, I think, which is what attention do I need right now and how can you support me, the other person, in giving me that attention so that my needs are met and and then turn that around and say, well, what attention do you need? So how do we get to that point because I think what you're talking about is that all through your life you didn't necessarily get the attention you wanted or needed until you met the gentleman in Japan um, but you didn't also know how to ask for it or, or discover what you needed so how do we go about that that's a prime question <laughs> it's a wonderful question well 
the the only reason I I knew that something was out in my family. I didn't know what it was. I mean, we looked good. We looked really good. My parents told me they loved me all the time. But I didn't feel loved. I didn't feel something. Mm. And I've been asked for years, what's the difference between between attention, between love and attention? I'm saying the only definition I, I know of love is positive attention in action. Because we feel loved. And if we don't feel it, they can say they love us till the cows come home, as they say. And we won't feel that. And so everybody walks around with a big hole in there. That's what the attention factor is. It's a place in our body where we feel either good or bad attention. Everybody does, but they don't know what it is. And with how, how, how does this, I have to say to you, the reason why it's so hard for me to do this is that it's so simple <laughs> and people expect simple. So, so I go up to a person, this is how simple it is. I go up to a man and a parking lot attendant who probably hasn't talked to anybody all day. And I say to him, I bet you come from Ethiopia because I recognize an Ethiopian. And he says, how do you know? And I say, well, you look like an Ethiopian and you're the most beautiful people in the world. <laughs> and this man smiles 180 degrees from the front of his face to the back of his face. And that is what you do when you get the kind of attention you need. Your body does it, your body just does it. It's an automatic response. So I do that all the time to people, all the time, because I, I have to test my theories. Hmm. Um, I've got to write my book. I have two books out. I have a book for college kids that talks about attention. And I have a primary book that also talks about attention. And uh, they're, they've both gotten fabulous testimonials. But I'm a one-man band. Now, reason so many people have said to me, I want to be like you when I grow up. So I'm, and I've been asked to do a pilot program. Interesting, during this lockdown, people are beginning to think differently. They're, they, they, they say things to me, you know what else, you're 20 years younger than, uh, you know, you're 20 years older than I am. You've got twice the energy and you're so happy. And I said, I used to say, thank you. I don't say that anymore. I said, don't you want to know how I got there? Yeah. Now they want to know how I got there. So I'm going to do a pilot program and I'm going to, I think I'm going to start teaching other people to do it, to do what. Now you really have to know what kind of attention you need and want that's your first first job you have to figure that out because only when you tell people you know i really need to go to hawaii to write my book well why why can't you go down the block no i really need to go where it's quiet and where i'm all by myself and i have nothing to do but hawaii that kind of very specialized directions the more, the better you feel. First of all, you have to know how to give attention to yourself. That is, that is major. Mm. Before you can even ask anybody for it. Now, I moved from Los Angeles to New York when I was 77 years old. I was through with Los Angeles because you can't even drive there anymore. My kids weren't living there anymore. So I, and I love New York, not right now but I love it, you know, other times. And my son, my oldest son came in and he says, you're never going to make it because I had all these suitcases and, you know, boxes. I said, David, just watch me. <laughs> That's what I do. And my kids do come and uh, stay here with me. But it's, you have, well, that's number one. You have to really pin down what you want specifically. And then you have to start asking the people that you're, working with, living with me, that you've parented. Hey, I'd like to know what kind of attention you want. I need to know what kind of attention you want. And if you don't know right away, 
think about it and then come and tell me so that we can both working on your getting it and my giving it to you because they're probably not going to know. So give them permission to not know. That's very important. Hmm. And pretty soon, if you start walking this, it just becomes part of you. Now, I have piles of newspapers in my apartment of research. So I look for people who are giving people the kind of attention they like, we need. You got to bear in mind all the time, attention, being supported, being listened to, being included, being connected. This is what attention is. These are the things that you've got to do for yourself and with others. If you see somebody not feeling they're part of a group, ask them. Is there something you'd like to contribute? Some people go to a group and they sit there and they don't open their mouths up. You know, I know this is your first meeting, but is there something you would like to say to us? Recognize them and let them have a, you know, say something and be recognized. It's very easy. Okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you some stories. I was having lunch one day at sort of a high round table in a cafe. And next to me was a grandmother and an aunt and a mother sitting talking like crazy and a little boy who was their grandson, their nephew and their son. They were not paying one bit of attention to him. So if you don't get the kind of attention you want, you have to act out to get any. And there are only two kinds, bad or good. And if you've only gotten bad attention in your life, that's all you know how to get. Anyway, he finally started crawling around the floor and he came by my table. And he had a little airplane on his shoulder, a little pin. And I said, oh, I like the air, I like your airplane on your shoulder. And then his relatives at the next table decided if a total stranger was talking to this little boy, they should leave. So they all got up and they said, come on, whatever his name was. But he walked right next to me and he said, goodbye. Hmm. Just like, so I had recognized him and connected to him. Yeah. It's pretty simple, isn't it? When you tell a story like that, um, that yes. all it is, is just observing, paying attention, but, but then caring about the other person and showing some empathy and, and looking for a connection. That's all it is. Mm. And that's what people, that's why we're in the place we are, because it doesn't matter how much money you have, people jump off roofs. They're so empty with what they need. I had a magazine from uh, when I was doing my work with television and children. It said, if children do not get the kind of attention they need in, in childhood, they spend their whole lives looking for it. Mm. And we've got a pretty visible example of that right now, but we'll talk about that after the recording. Uh, that um, Unfortunately, some of those people end up in some fairly powerful positions. Yes, they do. Mm. Now, I gave a speech at uh, University of Berkeley and at UCLA to a group of insurance people about risk management. And I was talking about this and saying people have to act out if they don't get what they need. And the, the um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, the judge, the workers' compensation judge who was there just listening, when I left, I had to walk up some stairs. She walked up some other stairs and met me at the top of the stairs. And she says, I have never heard anything like this. Your insights are lethal. She said, well, no wonder my daughter said to me last night, I don't care if I ever talk to you again, 16-year-old daughter. Mm. She says, this is what I see every day in front of my courtroom. People coming, they can't get listened to, they can't get heard, they can't be recognized, they can't be supported. They have to show up in front of my bench. And it costs a lot of money to take a case to uh, 
uh, uh, you know, the uh, risk management. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Oh, she's telling me this story. A man who was a uh, whose second language was English was trying very hard to talk to his supervisor, who wouldn't listen. So he he finally got so desperate that he called uh, that he he created a, a workers' comp case. And the judge said to him, did you like your job? He said, yes, I did like my job. And he said, she said, would you go back and work with these people again? He said, yes, I would if they'd listen to me. <laughs> I don't know what happened to the case, but I keep getting validation for what I've learned. Now, the reason I even got the clue, because I didn't know what I'd done. My two older kids were terrific. One was 10 years older and one was seven years older. And this was a, uh, this was a three-year-old and he was sitting, my father died about this time. And I knew I was going to have to be very on, very present with my mother. So I, I uh, hired a nanny from Bolivia who didn't speak much English. And of course she wanted to sit in front of the television set so she could learn English. And of course, she put my son in front of the television set, so he learned English. I mean, he was speaking English, but got a <laughs> he spoke it now with a Spanish accent. <laughs> I knew he was watching too much television because I had stopped watching television because I would watch a drama, an English drama or a, any drama, and all of a sudden, uh, the television announcer would come in and say, you need to buy this kind of toilet paper. Or if you buy your kid this many friends, and these many toys, you'll have more friends. They were lying to everybody. The commercials lie. And if we let our kids watch television, this is part of my backstory, we are lying to our kids. It's the bottom line. Hmm. So I was really lying to Jonathan, who has said, you saved my life, mom. And I'd like to do your work. And uh, he's teaching English in Bangkok right now. And he and his his fellow teachers had to do a workshop for their principal and everybody. And they did it on attention. And the principal, the, 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 uh, the people to whom they were giving it clapped at the end. And he heard some teachers say, to the principal, I don't want to give this so-and-so a, a student any more bad attention. So it's like I, I have my whole life is an alert because it's as you know, it's so simple, nobody I'm not the only one talking about it. Yeah. Now help me. It's ridiculous. Well, we'll get the message out. So how how can people find out more about your work and how can they get a hold of your book, Attention Matters. Well, actually, there's two books, right? Um, there's And there's a white paper there, Attention, It's the Problem, It's the Solution. Uh, my work, uh, my, uh, my uh, website is www.theattentionfactor. It's got a nice meditation on it. People seem to like that a lot. Hmm. Uh, it's got the two books. And... Uh, you know, it's, I, I've been a coach, and I've coached some very prominent people in Los Angeles. I'm a keynote speaker. I was in the bathroom once in Arizona, and a woman, when she came to wash her hands, she said, Alice, i got to tell you something. I've learned more from you in your two workshops and the keynote speech as I've learned in seven years of therapy. That's how simple it is. People cry when they come up to me, when they leave. I spoke to a group of healers in Los Angeles, and this woman came up to me and sobbing, saying, I've been looking for this answer my whole life. Hmm. So I'm going to do my my uh, pilot. Um, so the, the pilot is going to be an online course or an online presentation? It's going to be in Zoom. Yeah. So I, I can put it on my Facebook. And I'm on Facebook, Alice March. And I can put it on your website if you want me to. Um, it's very interesting. I've got three sons now. And I don't, I don't, I did earn, I've earned money. But they're very 
business oriented and I've got another father. It's gone right through the bloodline because my father didn't want to, didn't want me to earn any money because I would leave. And now my middle son, who is very, very wealthy and brilliant and smart mom, if you have a business and you don't make any money, you give up the business. <laughs> but you know what? I never had a business. I have a mission. Yeah. It's different. And I say to people, I probably would not even be here anymore if I had not learned what I learned because it has changed my life so much. Now, I want to go back to the reason. Uh, these things go through families. I want to go back to the reason that my father never wanted to have any children, even though he was a prominent physician and people loved him. He had three brothers. They came from Europe and he was born in Ohio. And um, just before he was born, there was a daughter born who died. I did not know this. This was my mother's story. And I was talking to a psychologist one day and telling her the story and she says, well, Alice, you, you were a replacement child. You were the daughter that his mother and father never had. That's why they wanted a perfect daughter. I didn't know anything about replacement child children, but people have them. If a child dies in a family, they'll go and have another one. And then they'll expect a lot from that other one. Now, I don't think my father knew this, but she explained it all to me. And in my baby book, it said, Jerry, how like you to have gotten what you want, wanted a daughter. So there were tremendous, and my father didn't know, there were tremendous expectations for me. Mm. You know, it's all part of my story. Yeah, I think the it, expectations is kind of the opposite of attention, isn't it? Because we put expectations on other people, whether it's in family or whether it's in business. Um, we put expectations on people, we expect them to fit a certain perfect mold that we have in our minds. And we don't actually talk to them about what their needs are and what our needs are, because obviously those expectations come from some sort of need as well. And, you know, that need might be able to be served by a different sort of attention that helps both people. Well, this is really a new conversation. I think that needs just started to be recognized in the last 20 years. Uh, I remember reading a book about Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't drink, but I went everywhere for research. I wanted to hear why people were in AA. And this one girl got up and she said, well, I didn't get any, intent uh, any attention at all in my family until I got drunk. <laughs> so I had a book from AA. And I read the word dysfunction. It had to be in the last 30s. I never heard that word. We never used that word. So I said, oh, my God, my family was dysfunctional. But, but they were doing the best they could. They were high functioning. But I didn't get what I needed. Now, that that is for all of us, I think. So one day, I elected to take... Uh, manual training in middle school as opposed to uh, home ec because I wanted to learn how to build things. So I learned how to put a plug at the end of a cord so I could do that. I was so excited. I was so energetic. I was so proud of myself. I came home and I said, Dad, I really have something wonderful to show you. And I showed him and this is what he said. What do you have to know how to do that for? Now, this is what it did to me. When you're excited about something and you have somebody who squashes you so much, your cells take that in. So you won't do anything anymore because he cut right through my energy. So, um, the other day, I'm learning, I, I'm, I know this now, So, but I've always asked people to do things for me. I know how to do things. The other day, I couldn't get a top off of a bottle but I, that I needed. So I said, okay, Alice, put some hot water on it. 
No, first of all, I said, okay, I'll take it down to the concierges. I'll let them do it, which is unempowering myself. Mm. So I said, well, I'll just, I'll just run some hot water on. You know what happened when I ran hot water? It came right off. <laughs> I felt so proud of myself. I couldn't believe it. It's a little, but it's important to have that. I'm redoing every, as many memories as I can, and I teach people how to do them, how to re- how to replay an emotional memory. And we could do that. Mm. You just go into a meditative spot and you feel what you felt there. And you sit in that. And then you give the person who said whatever they said, new words in their mouth. Like, oh my gosh, now you can fix all the stuff in the house. I won't have to worry about it anymore. I'm so proud of you, Alice. That's what I wanted. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've collected something called cringeables. <laughs> you know how somebody hits you in the stomach and you cringe? Okay, I ask people what they remember their parents said that could be classified as a cringeable. Well, this was the first one I got. This lady had to be in her late fifties from her mother. Well, if I knew what you were going to look like, I would never would have married your father. Mm. If I had $25, I would have aborted you. Yeah. Some, some of those are pretty brutal, aren't they? And, and people, yes, people, they think are. It's, people think they're being funny. And they aren't. And kids remember, mm. I, I've got people all over the United States at least having birthday parties because I did a whole thing on birthday parties. And this one raise, a man raised his hand and said, I will never have a birthday party. I will never eat coconut cream cake again because my mother made that every time I had a birthday. She never asked me what kind of cake I wanted. And I can't stand that cake. He's never had a birthday party until he met me. I said, you got to go somewhere with a bunch of people and really celebrate all those birthdays at one time. He did. That's the day we were born. Mm. Then at, I, I was a main speaker for a week in a spa in Mexico. Wonderful place. And, and I galvanized the room because I said, okay, today we're going to talk about birthdays. And a young girl, I mean, a young girl, 30, 35, was there with her mother. And she said, my father was never home for my birthdays. I've never, I never had a birthday with my father. And his her mother said, your father came home every year on your birthday. And they fought right in the room. And she finally said, mom, whose birthday was it? Which was a wonderful I mean, it was her birthday, not her mother's birthday. Mm. I love that. I love that. But it's amazing. And then we work on those memories. So, re, yeah, re, reframing the memories and reliving them and celebrating them in, in a way that you kind of catch up on that attention. Absolutely. And it, you're through with that. Now I'm through with that. I'm, I'm uh, doing all the manual training in my house. You no, know, I don't have to feel bad about that. And I don't have, I'm learning how to really work with my computer. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, that's a pretty important skill to have these days of social isolation where that that's one of the primary ways. Now we connect with the outside world. And when it doesn't work, it makes me sort of crazy. Mm. I had a virus. That's what I had. Yeah. Yeah. I had a man who fixed me up remotely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Alice, this is fascinating, this conversation about attention and, and how it applies to life and business. I think there's a lot of lessons there, and I certainly encourage people to check out your books and your presentations. There's lots of YouTube uh, speeches or recordings of speeches that you've given that um, give a lot more insight into this. So I encourage people to visit those and have a look. I think it's a good time now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful snappy answers with something that 
people can go and do in an awesome way today. So what's the, what do you think is the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Well, my work is all innovative. Yeah. So just my work. You know, I've, I've talked to a whole bunch of CEOs who said they were more energized than they'd ever been before. One went home and started talking to his adult son differently and it changed the relationship. Hmm. So listen to your work, read the books and implement something you learn. That's absolutely true. Mm. You, you know, these, did I, I don't think I told you about the two women who came up to me after a very wonderful conference. I didn't know them. They came up to me separately, said, don't stop doing your work. My husband asked me if he's giving me the right kind of attention. Hmm. They were so excited. Yeah, wonderful. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Well, I'm, that's a wonderful answer because I'm doing that right now. I, I don't know why, but I became, I've been in my house for almost 15 weeks. And it's, it's given me time to really go through some stuff I never did. And I became a teenager. <laughs> And I've been very, very, very uh, teeny. I mean, teen-like. And I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm going to do this pilot, which is new. And I'm going to do all new exercises in the pilot that I've never done before. I'm also going to get more aggressive about this. Because it's, it's, as I said, I've, I've done it myself. I knew nothing about attention. I had an epiphany over my head. First and last. One word, in, in dimension, attention. And then I said, that's a clue. And I went looking. And I went, the first time I went around doing research, I went in 70 books. The back of 70 books. Attention was never there except with ADHD and ADD. That's all. And after this, and I got this because there's a, there's a book out called Love, Medicine, and Miracles by, not, by Dr. Bernard Siegel, who was a surgeon. I had it from my first work when I was executive director of this nonprofit. And I was looking for it, through it, and it, I looked in the back. It didn't, have a, it didn't have the word attention, but I stopped at a place. I don't know why I stopped. I just stopped reading somewhere. And this is very important. And I should, t this is really the basis of my going on in my work. A female surgeon was hanging out on a Friday afternoon with a male patient on whom she was going to do surgery the following week. And she said, you know, they were just chatting. And she said, to him, I want you to come in and have another x-ray on Monday. And he said, okay. Then they chatted some more. He came in on Monday, had the x-ray, and then she came in to see him. And she said, I am so glad you had that x-ray. And he said to her, why? And, he sa and she said, because your tumor has shrunk from the last time and it's in a better place to operate. I don't know why. And he said to her, I do. Because when I was hanging out with you on Friday, I felt very safe with you. I felt that I was going to be okay and that you really cared about me. Hmm. And I said, that's what I have been looking for. That's what attention is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a great story. Thank you. Hmm. And the book right up there. I should really write to Dr. Siegel. He's done some amazing work. Hmm. He must be pretty old. Okay, now what's what, what's a resource you talked about books? Um, is that one of your favorite resources? Yes, well, I got a lot of books. I had books about television, and um, I have some books that have attention in their title, but nobody is talking about it like I am. Mm. Nobody. There's something called the attention economy, but they don't talk about it like I do. 
um, and newspapers. I get the New York Times and magazines, and I get wonderful stories. Now, recently, I think I, even, I, I, I don't know, I get a bunch of magazines. A little girl was pronounced in school being an autistic child. And the teacher told her mother that she had to take her out of the school, a mainstream school, and put her in another school where there were more of the same kinds of students. The mother said to herself, I am not going to do that. I'm going to get a tutor and I'm going to spend more time with her. Fast forward about a month, the tutors came and said to the mother, you know, I don't believe this, but your daughter is focusing more. Mm -hmm. You know, autistic children are all over the place. Now this child is a graduate of one of those prominent colleges in in Europe, I think. It's either Oxford or Cambridge or something. At a very young age, she has no autistic symptoms at all. Gone. Now, oh, I'm going to give you, okay, Sunrise. S-O-N-R-I-S-E was a major book for me. I can't remember the man's name. His son was an autistic child. They had him tested and they told him to take their child to another school. He said, no way. They turned their bathroom into a lab and they had people come in and they mirrored everything this little boy did. And pretty soon, he wasn't acting so crazy anymore. And by the time he was five years old, I think they took him between two and three. The, this book is fascinating. Mm. Um, they had interns who would come and do this one. By the time, well, he now was in charge of the school. <laughs> and he went to an Eastern University. And it was because he got what he needed in the bathroom. Yeah. You know, look that book up, Sunrise, S O N R I S E. And they talk about it. And, and uh, people come from all over the world to go there, mm. bring their kids. Mm. Fascinating, it, yeah, fascinating story. And it sort of it certainly highlights that, you know, giving people what they need. I mean, everybody's different. If you give them a label, that really isn't helpful. But you see, we feel attention because it's an energy. Mm. So if it feels good, we thrive. And if it doesn't feel good, we start acting out. We punch yeah. people. We're bullies. We do all those nice things, you know. So what's, what's the best way to stay on track with this? If, you know, if we kind of take your advice and we talk to people about what attention do you need? We do some self-exploration. What attention do I need? How do we stay on track with this? Invite me over. <laughs> and that's what they did in New Zealand. And I had a man, it was an amazing trip. I met a woman there and we became friends and then we went on the internet. I didn't really know her, but she came to Los Angeles, told me she was going to be at the airport for nine hours because she was going to Canada and there was a stop in Los Angeles. I said, you will not be at the airport. I will come and pick you up and take you out and spend some time with you. Now, this is a, this is almost a strange lady who came up to me in this shop and said to me, are you a healer? Hmm. And I said, yes. And she started to cry. There's something going on in, in uh, New Zealand. The Maoris are incredible healers. Anyway, she came. We had this wonderful time. And she said, well, what can I do for you? And I said, I, could, I would like to come to New Zealand to teach. She said, okay, I've got your network, which incidentally she didn't have. I, I We both learned the hard way. She had a financial uh, network. They were all invested. But what I needed was a healing network. So I went and I'm sitting having dinner. Nobody's coming to my workshops because they all want to earn, they all want to know about money. Anyway. So um, a friend of mine is in New Zealand the same time I am, and they come. I, I said I can't have dinner with you because 
I'm going to have a network that I'm going to have a, a, I have a workshop that night. Nobody came. So I said to Ann, let's go out and have dinner. So we went to the hotel. We're talking. I said, well, I'm not going to do this anymore because it's just too depressing. And my friend walks in with a, with her husband and another man, my friend from that I grew up with in Detroit, Michigan. And I pretend this game where if you look at somebody long enough, they got to look at you. Mm -hmm. That's really a childhood game. And the man who's with them says, that lady over there is looking at you, Ann. And Ann looks and gets up and runs over. My goodness, we have this big reunion. And the man puts his thumb up, his second finger, and says, come over here. Come over here. And he says to me, what do you do? And I said, I'm an international speaker. And he starts finishing my sentences. Everything I says, everything I said, he finished. What are you talking about? Oh, attention. Oh, because everybody needs it. I said, yes. <laughs> he said, you can't leave and you have to have a workshop in Auckland and I'm going to come. That was the first time I got the support I needed. So I did. Anyway, he says, I want you to meet my mother and I have your network. And he did. He had a network of psychologists, psychiatrists, healers. Mm. So I went and met his mother and I said, tell me what's going on with your son. And she says, well, he was reading you. He comes from, he has his black Irish grandmother's uh, psychic abilities. I never, I mean, it was unbelievable. So he came, he said, Alice, how much have you paid for this? I'm going to give you half the money. He said, I had to come. I had to come because I had some, I had some questions about my father and you answered them. Don't stop doing what you're doing. Hmm. Great. So, yeah, love the story. Well, I got story. Yeah. So have me and his mother was a professor at the University of something, and she was studying why there were so many Maori crib deaths. It had to do with the mattress in the crib. But you know what? I went to a place called Zenergy. I got this name from them, a group who were or, uh, organ uh, were organizers. What do you call them? Um, office organizers, systems organizers. They're like appreciative inquiry. Do you know that bit? It's a good thing to mm. do because they're doing new things. Anyway, they sent me to Zenergy. I gave them my workbook. The only man who was there, the women had gone off in a corner to look at the workbook, but he'd already seen it. He yells out, Dale, you won't believe this. Alice has in her workshop, what, uh, in her book, what we worked all weekend to get at the workshop. Mm -hmm. So I'm the, I just say I'm the best kept secret in town. <laughs> I walk around, you know, I'm, I'm my father's daughter, I'm my mother's yeah. daughter. All right. Now, I think uh, you've probably answered, I think we've answered this all throughout the conversation today, but what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? From? From other people. I mean, the background of this question is okay. really about uh, kind of in a business sense. Well, you can start. You can start a conversation. You know, I heard this lady on the podcast the other day. Boy, she was talking about things I never heard of. But you know, she's right. Or whatever you want to say. She, and I've been looking, I've been doing what she said. I walk up to people if they, I don't know. She says, I, I've just become an attention giver lately. She's right. They always smile. Mm. You some of my stories, um, but they got to have conversations. I'll tell you what it does in a, in a corporation. It ups the productivity. It ups the, the morale in the office. So everybody's happy at the end. If they're not happy, they steal, they come in late. They set, they sabotage the office. They do all kinds of things because they, they got to act out. And then they get fired and they want to know why they were fired. 
you know, it's 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 really an amazing phenomenon. Mm. I do not know why I was picked. I know that this work has really come to me because I knew nothing. I was so desperate and so afraid that something would happen to my youngest son that I really, I must have put it out into the universe. I want to know what I did. And I got an answer. That's when I had the epiphany. But I was, uh, the, when I was executive director of this nonprofit, one of the questions we asked the programmers who came in one day to answer was, no, I, I've, got, uh, I've got it backwards. We asked all the social service people who came in the first morning, what would you like to see children get from television? What do they need to see? That was the first time I ever used the word need. What do they need to see? And they gave me some really good answers. They need to see role models who look like them, who do, who, who are kind and generous, uh, just like Dr. Masaki was. He came to visit us twice in Michigan. I still miss him. Mm. And he's been here for a long time. Anyway, um, you have to really, you have to hear how important attention is. Somehow, when you talk to people about this, you have to say, you know, it's our primary need. Yeah. Start looking for it in magazines. You'll find it. Mm. That's right. And uh, as you said earlier, we if we don't get the attention that we need through what we're doing now, we kind of play up or act out or do something counterproductive until we do get that uh, attention or we keep doing something different. You know, they are now putting disabled kids on horses mm. so they could get, so that they learn what boundaries are and how to be in control. And the, the emotional stress is leaving these kids. Yeah. There are so many examples like that. Mm. You know, if you're, if you're a parent, and you haven't gotten the kind of attention you needed, you have no idea what that means in your life, and you could be a very mean, awful, destructive parent without knowing any difference. Hmm. But you can turn it around. Oh, absolutely. Hmm. That's what his fathers have done who are CEOs. Hmm. Hey, hey, to a 20-year-old, you know I heard this crazy lady, she, she talks about something that's so simple, but I never heard of it. I don't think I, did I ever get, did I give you the right kind of attention when you were growing up? Well, dad, that's a very interesting question. How come you answer that question? No, the answer is no. I didn't want to be a jock. I wanted to be an artist. Mm. That's what happened. Yeah, that's right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Alice. This has been really fabulous. Now, where, where can people reach out to you? You mentioned the website before. Are there other places where people can find you and maybe even get in touch and say thank you for what you've shared with us today? Um, uh, I want to give you one more other tip. I don't know if you've ever heard of neo-linguistic programming. Yes. You know, there are th three ways that we are, uh, three mode of operations it's like an operating system when we are born you're either visual or auditory or kinesthetic and your children will tell everybody will tell you what they are i will i see what you mean they'll say mm. that or i hear you or i get it that's a tip if they say i hear you they're probably in the music world singers symphony and get it is a kinesthetic word. So that's why kids can't sit still in class because their operating system is to move around. Yep, yep. That's, there's some magic you can learn from NLP in terms of how to communicate with people and give them the attention that they need to, to recognize what attention they might need. Yeah. Mm. All right, well, thanks. For this, Alice, this is fabulous. Now, finally, who would you like me to chat with on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? Well, 
I talked to a very interesting lady today on my show who in 2016, Helen Dennis, was recognized by PBS, Next Avenue, as one of 50 influences in aging. And um, people are retiring, both men and women, and they they don't know what to do. Mm. But they're they're hale, they're hardy, they've been in a big career. And she said uh, she told me things I didn't know about. What is called uh, vi- village, vi- uh, vill- the village. They got two hundred of these in in America, where people want to age at home. But they they could they build a village where people can go and just talk amongst talk to each other, and they don't talk about their health. They talk about new things they're doing, um, finances, all kinds of things, giving back. Another thing that I love is encore career. Mm. Yeah, fascinating topic. All right, well, we'll get an introduction to Helen from you and um, have a chat with her on a a future podcast. So thanks for that. And thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights and your attention with us so generously today, Alice. I've really enjoyed this immensely. There have been some fascinating stories there. I certainly encourage people to check out your work, listen to some of your presentations, because I know there's lots more stories and certainly the uh, concept of attention and that attention really matters and that it's a core need that we have is is so important. So all the best with spreading that message some more. Let us know how we can help do that and let's stay in touch. Yes, and one more question. Do you have rotary in in, uh, Australia? We do, yes. Well, you know, they have certain rules. You have to, your work has to fit into their rules. My work fits into their rule because I talked all over to Rotary in Los Angeles and I got testimonials and maybe they would support my coming to Australia. Okay. Well, I know some people in Rotary, so I'll float the idea. Great. Great. Okay. Yeah. I loved it. I loved it. Listen, I can't keep it to myself anymore. (laughs) That's right. Thanks a lot, Alice. Bye for now. Let's keep in touch, definitely. I hope you enjoyed that informative and enlightening conversation with Alice and took something away from her episode. She's certainly passionate about the topic of attention and why it is so important. For me, it's encapsulated in her statement that love is positive attention in action. I'd love to know what you took away from Alice's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Alice Aspen March. That is A-L-I-C-E-A-S-P-E-N-M-A-R-C-H. All lowercase or one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Alice Aspen March. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Alice there, as well as links to the Attention Factor website, to her books, to her social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about in the conversation. Alice suggested that we have a conversation with Helen Dennis, speaker and author on issues of ageing and the new retirement, on a future InnovaBuzz podcast episode. So Helen, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Alice Aspen March. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast, where we've got some more fantastic guests lined up, including Roger Salem of The Winner's Circle and founder of Book, Speak, Repeat, Kerry Heaps. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. 
Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.